public and private domain, right? Users are forced to work remotely and uh, independently. And applications are still siloed and remaining back in our secure on-prem ecosystem. The challenges of this architecture results in network bandwidth and increase in cost of operations and makes it operationally very difficult even for your internal IT to manage this ecosystem. By some of the use cases that you will see in this webinar today, we will be able to showcase how to simplify this uh, unique situation that we all are in together. And what are the best steps in which you can make these changes and in the fastest manner. So that is why we said accelerating to public cloud as the agenda for today. Before I go into the webinar agenda, let me just give you a brief overview. Intertech, as Intertech, now we are in our 30th year of, uh, of operation. We've already completed 29 years. We are a company that started in UAE. We are headquartered, headquartered in Dubai, but we have got offices across in Abu Dhabi, Saudi, uh, Bahrain, Oman, and two offices, development centers, and a knock in Mumbai and Bangalore. We've been rated as one of the top 10 system integrators across GCC. We drive very long-term partnerships with key accounts in multiple sectors, especially on government banking and local conglomerates who are into multi-dimensional businesses. As an organization, we carry uh, a lot of uh, technology alliances. My division is the newest branch of that growth and we are striving to become one of the leading cloud providers also in this market. We've got operations in India, so we, we also present a competitive price point of service delivery, which is very predominant in our cloud adoption roadmap because cloud can be managed and delivered from anywhere. Our software delivery centers work very closely with us in more complex deployments of DevOps and application development but also have a very strong practice around the Microsoft framework as well. I will not go into the details of our existing ecosystem because as I said, there are more than 50 partnerships. But what I want you to know from this slide is that every partnership that we carry, we have the capability to consult and deploy completely within. Most of the vendors that we carry today, we are the, at the highest level of certification that a partner could be to drive that engagement. This trend carries over on our cloud ecosystem also. As you may have noticed on our title slide, we call this Intertech Cloud Experience. And Intertech Cloud Experience, we use these solutions and vendors to adopt their technology to present our service architecture to you. Most predominantly in that ecosystem is the platform of Azure. Today at Intertech, we, have, we are happy to say that we have now become, in a short journey of two years, an Azure expert MSP, an Azure migration partner. We are a focused growth partner for Azure globally. We are also carrying eight gold competencies of Azure today in the market. Now, when I say Intertech Cloud Experience, this entire uh, discussion is revolving around what you experience in the transformation journey. The entire discussion of digital transformation can be a very lengthy and a vast discussion. For us, the starting point of that discussion is two basic criteria. If your application is going to be consistently consumed within your secure network, if your application is going to be inconsistently consumed within your secure network, or if your application is going to be consistently consumed from, an, uh, from a user who is from, your, uh, from a public network, or your application is inconsistently consumed from a public network. By that, the architecture gets automatically split. Uh, any kind of capital investment that you do in a consistent uh, uh, consumption architecture makes sense. Any kind of capital investment you do in an inconsistent consumption architecture does not make sense and requires scalable, hyperscaler cloud architectures. Any kind of architecture that you create that 
merges the public and private uh, traffic will increase your network cost and your security cost because these will be used to create some kind of flexibility for external resources to uh, access this application. Similarly, any kind of architecture that is sitting on-prem has to deliver a higher performance. So with this simple logic, if you proceed further, Intertech has devised nine different uh, strategy headers that are used to deploy the entire architecture. Most of the strategies can be adopted as an organization. Today, we'll be focused on the multi-cloud compute management piece and the starting bit being the lift and shift migrations. But when you talk about this solution, we will be utilizing the data management ecosystem and we'll also be presenting the hybrid multi-cloud network fabric architecture. We will also be presenting the monitoring and the service delivery operations for this architecture. So when you say that these are not uh, these are all individual strategies, but they are completely interlinked and uh, integrated with each other, and that's how that's the beauty of our adoption strategy. We don't say that any organization can become completely cloud native in a day. There is a roadmap. Our major focus to, uh, till now, we have had a three webinar series this month, and this is the last webinar uh, of that series. Our focus has been to drive SaaS adoption. We did a, a, a with where we clubbed the backup and DR services. We focused on the modern workspace solutions where we went up to the VDI architecture because that is relevant to this time. And now we are focusing back on the public VM setup and how that ecosystem would function. In today's webinar, we'll be talking about the lift and shift and the file share on the cloud ecosystem also. Today, they, we will have presenters I will be presenting the basic overview. I will have uh, Ganesh talking about the cloud assessment framework. We'll have a presenter from NetFoundry and I will be taking care of the NetApp presentation as well. The, before you start adopting a public cloud architecture, there are two prerequisites. The virtual machines are not managed completely by the platform. There are attachments that you need to consider before you start moving to public cloud. The two prerequisites of connecting to any ecosystem are how is the data being managed on that architecture and how is the network connectivity to that architecture. If you consider, carefully consider these two points, these go hand in hand with the entire ecosystem. Now, I would like to hand over this discussion to the technical manager of our implementation, which is Ganesh Prakasam and he will take over the discussion on cloud assessment framework and our ideology as to how we move to public cloud. Cloud assessment framework uh, that we execute as is as per the Microsoft standards. So we carry the same uh, we carry the same uh, structure of uh, assessment that is followed by Microsoft. So starting from the strategy point of view, like uh, we understand why customer wants to move for to uh, Azure Cloud and what is the reason behind all the requirements that we understand. Once we do the understanding of why customer wants to go, then we initiate a plan. So that plan consists of the understanding of the existing infrastructure, what kind of workloads that can be migrated and how it can be migrated. And moving on to next is ready. So once we understand the plan of what is to be migrated, then we initiate a, a you know, complete Azure setup to make the infrastructure ready on an Azure level. And once it is ready, then we initiate a pilot migration. Once the pilot migration is done, then slowly we move all the new applications from priority, whichever is uh, sequenced as per the priority, and then we move each and every applications to the cloud. Now, during this process, so you must be seeing is like there is a continuous monitoring and governance to be followed in Azure. So it is not only after moving that we have our work is completed. We need to ensure that it is completely managed and monitored on a continuous basis so that 
we continuously see the cost efficiency in terms of what is the cost model whether there is the increase or decrease in the cost model so that there is a option to optimize the resource running on the cloud and then managing those setups is also a continuous process after the cloud adoption framework yeah okay now in many organizations we must be uh, thinking like uh, you know uh, what is the triggering point uh, for the migration so we would be uh, thinking like uh, you know uh, can i go now can i do the migration and a few of the customers they must have seen the drastic uh, you know change in uh, requirements they are dynamic to their organization they need to support their business so in that angle if you look at there can be a reason that uh, you know uh, migration of uh, data uh, data center or you know reducing the cost of a data center or there is the integration of my business application with the third party application so for the enhancement or some other integrations or there is a drastic capacity need that needs to be done so based on that driving factors you might be thinking of moving to cloud so is also one more thing important like uh, the on premises security threats like uh, am i compliant with my security standards are my uh, are I, am i saving those data properly as per the uh, compliance or iso audit point of view so those are all the key points that triggers the uh, migration for cloud many of us uh, might be thinking like once we uh, plan to move to cloud so what are all the components do i need to implement all the components so these are all the advanced level components which is uh, in cloud but uh, do i need to consider all this into a migration factor it is really not it is depending upon the application so i have done some uh, uh, break up into the basic level of architecture which we can see here this azure platform we have break down into four layers so first layer is the one which as a client will be connecting it it might be a client who is connecting or it is from an on premises hybrid uh, architecture which will be connecting the platform to azure the next layer will be an integration layer which comes into your front end services mostly uh, either a firewall or a network connections or your uh, other uh, access controls those kind of services will be coming into picture as a first layer to allow an access to your applications the application layer is nothing but your websites which is hosted in azure as well as pass services and your ias applications is a is your virtual machines running on applications so those are all the applications which will be hosted there and the third layer if you look at it the uh, final layer your complete data which is residing in the azure storage it can be a block storage or it can be a managed disk or in different form of uh, storage so this is the high level content uh, components that will be uh, involved in the migration requirements as well as for a uh, basic uh, business requirement that can go to the cloud okay moving on to uh, technical assessments so when we you must have seen that we know what is the strategy for a company to move to azure so from that point as a planning we need to do a technical assessment during the technical assessment there is a sessions that will be conducted between the application owners and the business owners to understand what is their application side they want to do it and how what are all the applications that are all integrated with and who are all accessing the user uh, applications similar way where are the dependencies and uh, what is the performance of each application to do the right sizing in for the azure and then during this assessment we define which is the low priority applications that can be migrated and then a critical workloads that can be migrated so as a pilot there will be a migration that will be performed for the test environment or uh, low priority applications that will get migrated and once it is migrated 
and there will be subsequent testing will be done along with the application owner and finally once it is uh, once it is confirmed everything is okay then uh, subsequent applications will be replicated and kept it ready so once there is a cutover is defined between the applica uh, application owner and the end user and the business the cutover will be performed and it will be completely moved to the migration so once the migration is completed what is next there is a governance will come into picture in terms of what is the resources migrated and what is the current uh, sizing which is as per the sizing and as also a regular uptime uh, governance as well as security part of it there should not be any kind of a security breach is there any uh, 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 environment is protected my data is not going anywhere so how this tightly connected and how it will be tightly uh, you know secured so that the data is not moved anywhere and um, finally we also do the optimization in terms post assessment and post migration what is uh, planned and what is requirement so once you move to uh, azure because of the latest technology there are uh, more number of uh, 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 performance improvement you will be getting it because of the uh, azure cloud uh, services so by that way there is a possibility that you can reduce the uh, sizing of the virtual machines or uh, compute level you can reduce the sizing as well as you can also do a, a backup changes so those are all continuous monitoring and uh, optimization that can bring into uh, picture so this will be a continuous process from the adoption starting to the complete uh, management uh, section let's talk about application migration ideology so here uh, so whatever we discussed related to the uh, assets of uh, iis migration that is a virtual machine migrations whatever it not premises and migrating to the cloud when it comes to uh, application migration application migration is also a, a similar way so what we just need to understand from the application migration so we need to plan for a, a detailed understanding of how the functional point of the applications once the functional point of the application we, we understood who are all the users and uh, similar way who are all the people connecting to that one what is the business impact if the application goes down so what uh, how far we can take a downtime of this on migration from the current position can i migrate this application by only replicating the content and develop a new set of applications in the cloud itself through web apps or through other form of application development so this complete migration will have the understanding and the detailed assessment including a planning and executions will be taken care post the execution a complete check of uh, application migration including performance data access everything should be taken care as part of the migration so when it comes to lift and shift migration so there are multiple uh, forms of lift and shift migrations uh, starting from a physical to uh, azure migration or virtual to azure migration so azure provides a default native migration tool called azure site recovery with that site recovery we understand what is the workload available on uh, on premises that will be migrated to azure as a initial replication once the initial replication is completed then we define when to migrate or when to cut over the complete workload to the azure once it is cut over is done there will be a uh, another set of activities that will be performed to ensure that the applications are running perfectly in azure this these are all the basic uh, application approach, approach for the migration from ias to and uh, pass so based on the understanding of what are all the applications what all the workload that is running on on premises and uh, during the assessment we define what can be migrated as is and what can be migrated 
from a database to a pass services so those assessments will be done so then we will do a web level migrations even a single services is getting migrated to azure then we need to have the backup in place so that the data in azure is protected and it is compliant or it is recoverable then we define a non critical applications and once the non critical applications are migrated then we move the remaining applications like uh, database to a pass solution a platform as a service database or we can move some other uh, solutions like vdi so can i move the my vdi on premises vdi to work uh, azure vdi with my uh, you know end user mobility with the secure connections so and then moving on to a hybrid integration so in the governance and monitoring so we uh, do a regular uh, monitoring of the azure environment so whatever is migrated so through our uh, monitoring system we manage the complete uh, environment and monitor the complete environment with a, a detailed monitoring which can provide uh, understanding of the application where it is integrated and also provides a detailed uh, information about where is the root cause of the issue so when there is an issue is triggered it is not a basic monitoring uh, system alone it can provide a detailed understanding and detailed information about where is the bottleneck of your application why your application is going down so it will go into that uh, detailed information to capture and showcase that this is where your bottleneck is that is where uh, uh, your applications are uh, either slow or it is down So thank you, Vinish. Thanks for giving us the you. architecture and the uh, methodology by which uh, partner customers uh, or customers can adopt public cloud. Now, while we were discussing this, you must, you all must have thought thought how users are going to connect. Today, everybody is connecting locally. Tomorrow, people are sitting at home. How are users going to connect to two different application servers? We have Mr. Philip here. Who is our partner and to discuss and present the solution on NetFoundry. Philip, uh, do you want to project the slide? Uh, no, you can just you know flick over to the next one and I'll 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 go off the slides you have. Oh, Philip, are you on mute? Uh, I don't think so. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah sure. So do you oh. want to project uh, project the slide now or no, just scroll over and um, I'll present from your deck. It's easiest. Morning, everyone. A pleasure to be here. Or in fact, afternoon for you guys. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through NetFoundry and why it's relevant to to your your journey from the to the cloud. Um, you know, we a, a lot of the story that that we've been talking about is 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 how we can achieve higher agility. How can we achieve um, higher consumption-based, OPEX-based services by moving to the cloud because we get higher value from you know, more services and, and the platform capabilities. Uh, and fundamentally, NetFoundry is a, a rethinking of networks in exactly the same way. Instead of infrastructure as a service, software as a service, platforms as a, as a service, it's network as a service. It's the ability to move your networking into the exact same model as the cloud. It is the ability to achieve the security and the performance of a private network, i.e., uh, you know, MPLS uh, and, and express route um, from, from your telco, but to do it over your internet connection. Normally, your internet connection is best effort. Uh, your performance can vary a lot. You know, the, the term of the, the internet weather, one day it works, one day it doesn't. Um, and it's you know very unsecured, so we have to put security around it. NetFoundry essentially is a platform that consists purely of software and APIs, just like the cloud, and that allows you to connect absolutely anything over the public internet, but get the benefits of a private network. And that means, from a commercial advantage, that we can remove the MPLS costs. We can 
potentially remove the SD-WAN cost. Although if you have an SD-WAN and you want to deploy NetFoundry around it, no problem because we have zero disruption to the WAN. It means we can replace the VPNs. It means we can replace the express route. From a technical perspective, we're able to have higher security because we're able to implement zero trust and software defined perimeters and basically achieve cloud security alliance best practices in 10 minutes. Uh, we build end to end trust and encryption, not just link trust, so that your data, regardless of it going from source to destination, is always within your control and no one can get access or uh, utilize it in a way that you do not allow. With least privileged access, um, as is again the best practice recommended by Microsoft, uh, and also enhance that internet connection so you get you know less latency higher throughput um you know the interesting thing that people always ask me is how much are you going to improve my cloud connection and i always say i have no idea because <laughs> it depends where you're going from and to uh, conversely with netfoundry the further away the destination is the more we're going to improve your performance so you know if you connected for example from uh, dubai to to azure you know uh, you're not going to notice any difference because you're right next to the data center it's under 10 milliseconds if you connect to azure singapore or azure west europe netfoundry is going to make huge improvements uh, and from an innovation perspective because we're just software we can embed into anything you know we are the only uh, par company in the world that microsoft has embedded into five of their different products Azure Stack, Azure Cloud, Azure Edge, um, Office 365, and Azure Virtual WAN. Uh, and that means that we can go anywhere and even deliver inside the application. And I, I did say that, extend your security and your network into the application, into the CI CD pipeline. That is true zero trust. So if we if we go on to the next page, we'll see as an overview, this, this effectively means that, that we're delivering four things. Number one, it's the agility so that we can spin up a global wide area network as quickly as you can spin up a virtual machine from anywhere to anywhere with open source options if you want to use them as, you know, again, Microsoft are big on open source. NetFoundry has those options as well. It means that we can achieve the performance and optimization of a private network so that we can bring higher reliability and higher performance to the internet. How do we do this? Because normally people say, no, that's not possible. You can't, can't make the internet better. Effectively, NetFoundry, we've deployed a virtual network. Uh, you can almost think of it like a, a virtual MPLS, but on top of the internet, we exist within a hundred pops. Um, and those pops are gonna be anywhere between source and destination. So you don't have to hop onto our network to optimize it, right from your source, from your laptop, from your mobile, from your branch, we're gonna enhance that connection and we're going to find better paths uh, so that we basically build a lossless overlay mesh on top of any internet connection. At the same time, we deliver the security of zero trust, of software defined perimeters, of least privileged access control um, with API integration. So for example, uh, we've done integrations with uh, Azure Active Directory so that we can pull in access groups. We've done integrations with um, Microsoft Intune so that you have to um, meet the conditions of conditional access policy before a network is even built. So you know, correct geolocation, encryption on the laptop, any policy that you can and want to build within Microsoft, we can implement that as a context as to a network being built and that's all done on demand in minutes consumption based and because we're not having to ship hardware or circuits a wire or a box we're able to make large cost savings and deliver you much higher value on top of your internet and do it all with cloud orchestrated tools because it's just apis you want to use arm scripts no problem use arm scripts you want to use terraform no problem ansible whatever it's all APIs and infrastructure as code with zero disruption to your WAN. And it's not just us that are saying this. Gartner recognized us as a company who can provide, as they call it, enhanced internet, the ability to replace MPLS, Express Routes, Direct Connects, uh, and also a provider of zero trust network access, although they astutely no, no, uh, pointed out NetFoundry isn't a net network access provider, we're an application access provider but they don't have a list for application access yet. So we'll be in that one when they create it. But fundamentally, we're only two, one of two companies in the world that sells both of those things. So a quick example.
here's a migration overview of a customer that was going from an IBM data center into AWS. What's the key information here? Well, we were able to stand them up a network for four months just to temporarily do their migration. Over their MPLS and Direct Connect, they got three to four megabytes per second. With NetFoundry, they got 40 to 50 megabytes per second. So that meant being able to migrate a 1.1 terabyte database in seven hours instead of three days. If they'd used their MPLS and their cloud fixed connectivity, they would have had three days of business downtime. And that's not acceptable. So we solved that for them. If we go on to the next slide, likewise, we have that ability to go into a completely cloud native setup, completely DevOps compatible, where because we're just software, we can embed into a Kubernetes cluster, a Docker container, into the application with an SDK, whether it's Java, C, Sharp, uh, Golang, Swift, whatever the language is. If you don't want to go cloud native, no problem. We've got virtual machines uh, that deploy onto, um, uh, sorry, OVAs that deploy onto virtual machines for Azure, for AWS, for your private cloud. NetFoundry is in every cloud marketplace and we can deploy anywhere and everywhere. And because we've got those API integrations, because we're API first, we can use any tool within the DevOps process to extract or drive that interaction. Uh, and if we go on to the next overview, um, you know, that comes down to the fact that we are everywhere because we can deploy onto any type of laptop, any type of mobile, into any application and onto any edge. As I alluded to earlier, Microsoft um, embedded us into their Azure private edge zones, which is basically a one new rack that you can order for about $600 a month, completely OPEX, uh, and do edge processing. NetFoundry is embedded onto that so that we can provide secure and performer connectivity backhaul to Azure, to private data centers, to anywhere. And then effectively that enables us to deliver in any every scenario so osm maritime are a norwegian organization um, they set up connectivity between data centers in europe um, some of their SaaS applications users all across the globe but the key interesting bit of information their power bi went from taking two minutes to load to three seconds that for them is the power of net foundry for um, a customer in india they required secure remote connectivity during COVID-19. So we set up in less than six hours connectivity for their users to work from home, laptops and mobiles, for more than 200 employees across two data centers. And we increased their performance by 3x. Uh, for SAP migrations, the one I mentioned earlier, that's, that's you know, not the only one we've done. Here's another one. Uh, a customer was doing an SAP migration and they, they literally couldn't get enough throughput on their network. So their telco said, Increase your bandwidth. So they increased their bandwidth by 4x. Still, they couldn't get enough throughput on their network. They were building up a backlog of all the data. So we set up NetFoundry instead of using an IPsec VPN. And we delivered 3x performance on top of the same internet connection so that they were able to, to move their data and remove that backlog without having to deploy any hardware. So effectively, NetFoundry works anywhere and everywhere. We give you that ability to have high performance, high reliability, high security, and to not have to tie your cloud to the ground. If you're going to the cloud, why tie it to the ground with a fixed consumption-based network, um, uh, which is incredibly expensive? Instead, use NetFoundry on demand with much higher value for your organization. Thank you. So before I go into the next discussion, I want everybody to really think some of the biggest questions that come across in the local UAE market. If I move to cloud, will my network cost go up? Will I have to set up a larger VPN tunnel? Will I have to uh, procure express route connectivity? How will I secure the connectivity to the ecosystem? With this solution that you've just seen, it's not only simplified, rather optimized, and you may, you may be as well removing your MPLS connections because your users and your application are on the same layer of security and they have the same private network that they share. 
but also it is optimizing the entire network and giving a better performance than the MPLS connectivity. Can you use it for a small period of time? Yes, but once you adopt it, there is no comparison to that ecosystem. So that covers the first prerequisite. And I would like to thank Philip for giving such a uh, wonderful overview of this. Uh, I will be taking the discussion now towards the data architecture, the another prerequisite, which is also a big concern. And uh, until recently, a lot of uh, public sector and data sovereign uh, compliance customers in healthcare, in banking sector, did not adopt public cloud because of the data sovereignty issues. Now it's more towards how the management is happening, where are my uh, backup records and availability managed, and how is the ecosystem going to be compliant with your existing architecture. Intertech today is one of the only global companies who has a managed enterprise uh, service, IP Cosell, on Azure Marketplace. We've built that as an offering, which is managed and delivered on your tenant. What we are re replicating here is the basics of an enterprise grade architecture with multiple use cases. For example, in today's day and age, you don't talk about direct attached storage in any manner. Whereas natively, virtual machines in Azure are delivered as a direct ecosystem where disks are single point of failures. So we created a highly available storage where we had a guaranteed zero RPO failover architecture. Do can we replicate or take volume based snapshots or granular snapshots in uh, Azure ecosystem? The answer is no, you can take disk based or service based snapshots or replication. So we bring this overlay to ensure volume based operational snapshots that you use to take in your enterprise ecosystem. Can you do virtual storage sharing, which has been a concept in the market for a very long time? So, virtual storage sharing is possible in our solution, and you can tear it down to blob storage for a cold uh, backup ecosystem. We're delivering a unified storage architecture. We're delivering NAS, uh, NFS and SIFS architectures, and we're delivering iSCSI connectivity. This, uh, this solution is also capable of delivering the S3 protocol. Now, with the storage efficiencies, this solution is predominantly fit to optimize your cost of storage. Storage is going to be the permanent cost. It cannot be, it is going to be always active. Storage is not going to be uh, exponentially used only for the hours of consumption. Storage in Azure is always going to be active 24-7. So storage is basically going to be one of the majority of costs of the Azure adoption. By bringing in storage efficiencies like thin provisioning, deduplication, and compression, you are actually reducing the entire footprint and actually paying as you grow. Similarly, there are other advanced features like encryption, which is third-party encryption, which is controlled by you. No other person in the world has access to the architecture and persistent Kubernetes or ecosystems that we'll discuss later. What are the reasons why you're adopting? Basically, we are giving control of the data back to you. The biggest concern that any IT ecosystem would, uh, IT head would have. How do I control my data in cloud? Well, we are giving you the full control, the encryption, and how you replicate and manage that ecosystem. You control your data. It is an enterprise grade management architecture, so it is nothing new that you would be doing. You would be doing a volume based snapshots, you would be doing replication, you would be doing tiering setups, you will be doing thin provisioning and expansion of capacity based on volumes. Also, it does a one up there, it automatically expands when demand capacity is over uh, up to a certain level. You can bring in automation, which is native to the cloud. It is highly available. There is no single point of failure in the data architecture, which means you're giving an enterprise data availability also you to your Azure ecosystem. As I said, the storage efficiencies bring in cost optimization as well as pay as you grow growth functionality. This ecosystem has advanced hybrid integration, which we will discuss maybe in the, in the future stage. What are the use cases? Biggest issue today, your users are sitting outside your LAN network and they're accessing a lot of data, reading and writing a lot of data over expensive MPLS VPN connectivity unless you have a hybrid network architecture. But even then, this is a burden of not highest priority. These user data could have easily be sitting in public cloud 
where they are using only their private internet access to ex uh, extract data, but not, but this is an enterprise grade centralized data architecture. You are not using peer to peer connectivity like OneDrive or Dropbox to kind of save the data. Here, the company is centrally managing the data architecture and putting policies and controls using Active Directory. Presenting that kind of an ecosystem in cloud is of the first priority in this architecture, in this uh, day and age. If your users can use their private internet and get the access to data which you control in the public domain, that is the first priority today that you should be looking at. Can you move your existing file share to cloud? Yes, we can use Veeam, which is a partnered solution. We've done a workshop. The first webinar was for SaaS solutions as a pay-as-you-go option for a few months to replicate this data and we can move your file share to cloud. It can also integrate with your unified storage ecosystem and bring your NFS blocks to the cloud also. So you can use Veeam for your third party platforms to bring your data from uh, existing file servers or unified storage ecosystem to the cloud. And since we are presenting a unified storage on cloud as well, the SMB protocol exists and the NFS protocol exists. Another interesting use case is that we use the same ecosystem to, uh, to deliver profile container uh, 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 sharing ecosystem for our managed VDA architecture. Over here, we are not using it as a data repository. We are using it as a vehicle for extremely high performance guarantees for every user. By deduplicating the master image architecture, we are negating the need to have a, uh, negating the possibility of, of a bootstrap that can ever happen. As you can see, this also integrates with a network fabric ecosystem that we've just demonstrated to give optimized performance and connectivity. So the storage ecosystem here is a basic game changer and why endpoint computing on cloud is now possible. This ecosystem is negating the requirement and giving the control back so that every user is guaranteed the minimum performance at the time of boot, there is no bootstrap. Another functionality that, that functionality that you should consider is that we, have, we are presenting iSCSI connectivity, which is a SAN connectivity, which is usually used for your hosting of your virtual machines. In Azure, you've got availability zones. UA is an availability zone. You've got of availability in this region, which is in UA North, which is in Hawaii, and UA Central, which is in Abu Dhabi. Can you have a high available architecture supporting your applications uh, set today? The answer is yes, with this application you can. With this storage architecture, you can have synchronous data ecosystem working together, presenting to the same application and IP. This implication also can work as a, back, uh, as a primary and a DR setup on the storage level replication. Application level replication is good when you're talking about data incentive architectures like SQL and databases, but having a native storage to storage replication function built into the native storage architecture, which you deploy before migrating to cloud is going to improve your operational functionality also. I'm not going to uh, take more time, but there is an interesting use case, which is a final use case. As you've been seeing that Post as is migration. The next step is to modernize your application stack. When uh, Philip was uh, delivering his pitch, he spoke about how you can integrate and automate your application stack on the network layer. This ecosystem that we are presenting also presents native Kubernetes services in our managed DevOps architecture, which presents persistent storage options. When you're moving to cloud, once you're done with the emergency or when you, once you're done with the basic adoption, you need to start utilizing the hyperscaler capability, which differentiates an Azure with a native hosting facility available locally here. If you're using Azure for the right means, mean, means you're using Azure for on-demand growth and elasticity. And that can only happen when your services are converted into microservices and are containerized. We present the same storage ecosystem for creating that persistent storage architecture. So I presented to you five use cases. Move your file shares to cloud. Move, uh, integrate with your replication ecosystem. 
you uh, use it to deploy VDI architecture on cloud. Use it to uh, deploy a high available VM architecture on cloud between availability zones in Azure and use it as a persistent storage architecture as in native Kubernetes cluster. These use cases are unique, are enterprise grade, but they are not. They are saving you a lot of money and operational hassle in the future. With that, I would like to request you to unmute yourself, go for the question and answer sessions. If you want to discuss anything on, the, on these topics today, we've just scratched the surface. I would request you to go back to our marketing department who sent you the invites, register discussions with us. We would love to consult and discuss how we can make a story for you, which is unique, going to be unique for you. With that, I will uh, switch to a question and answer session. If there are any, I would be pleased to hear. Or if you prefer to chat, type it in the chat, I'm okay to answer in the chat. Uh, hello? Yes. Yeah, hi, it's Ajil from SSA. Uh, it is, uh, I'm talking to Manish. Mm, you're talking to Javin Rafiq. Okay, hello, Mr. Javin. Yeah, uh, I like the presentation. Thank you very much, first of all. And, uh, uh, but most of the solutions which you have provided are uh, inclined to the third party services which we have to take from Intertech, not not inclined to Azure inbuilt services. Uh, like uh, it means most of the things are going to manage services. If in case we plan to implement, you understood like most of the features which you have. I understood your point. I understood yeah, your point. Yeah. Let me explain my point over here. It is not like we've not done native Azure migrations till now. Why we are, when we come and discuss stuff with you, we are presenting a different mindset. We are presenting a differentiation and we are presenting optimization of, of cost in the short term and a long term. And we are presenting how the technology is to be adopted. All these solutions that you have today, if you go on an Azure marketplace, you will see more than 700 to 800 different IP cell solutions which improve the utilization story of Azure. See, what is Azure? Let's simplify it for an instance, right? It is a place where you've got managed PaaS services from Azure, which their ecosystem managed, which are adopted for the cloud platform. And you've got compute, RAM, and storage resources built into different performance grades and architectures where you have a fixed and a variable cost for each service. Are these, all these services meant to be utilized in the native stage? The answer is no. If that was the answer, these OEM solutions, for example, when, uh, my storage architecture today is OEM by Azure as an OEM pro product as well, called Azure Netapp Files. My network architecture is integrated into Azure's edge node computing. My assessment framework is completely built on Azure, but the cloud native monitoring ecosystem is again an IP cell available on Azure which with deep integration and research which is done between these two organizations. Everything, if you're expecting your entire IT ecosystem to be de developed and de uh, deployed from Azure only, then you're expecting a lot. And that's where Microsoft also understands that we it, the partnered solutions will deliver better technology and integration. And that's where they partner and uh, benchmark these solutions. What we are presenting to you is the next step of optimization and enterprise grade architecture. I think oh, understood. understood. Yeah, yeah, it's clear. It's clear. Nice to have a question. I would love to take more if there are any. I think so we have none, so I'm happy. I think so we delivered a good, clear content or we did not, we were very confusing. Either those two are correct. All right, so uh, Javin, uh, 
thank you for the presentation before we close uh, i would just like to tell our uh, attendees that the webinar recording will be made available immediately after this uh, session right so you can just uh, you know uh, again open the same window and the recording will be available within the next 5 minutes right so you can just uh, you know refer to it in future if required right and thank you again for joining us today it was wonderful having you all here and uh, needless to say if you have any queries any questions in the future you can always drop me an email you already have my email uh, with you so you can either call me or you can just drop me an email and i will connect you to javeen and uh, the other speakers yeah all right so thank you and have a good day ahead thank you pleasure thank you for joining we we are now closing our three webinar series any further future discussions i am hoping to have more one on one discussions with you thank you very much thanks everyone